Actually, it was a ship that was sunk uh, right there, right, right around D-Day. The whole ship with 31 men on were just lost. We were all kids, and we were fighting the Germans. It was a bad day all around. It was a bloodbath. Reconstructed Germany for war. The deception plan for Operation Overlord is about imagination and brilliance. It was planned in elaborate, elaborate, elaborate detail. They were just Germans trying to kill me, and we were trying to kill them, as simple as that. The beaches of Normandy were consecrated by the blood of our heroes. The Allies knew they were outnumbered and literally outgunned. Everything that everyone did was an act of bravery. You're in the line, you're one, you're one person. They were about protecting mankind based on those values. That, to me, has always been the mainstay of how you actually win over evil. It was the most monumental military operation in modern history. D-Day, June 6th, 1944. Now 75 years later, we look back in remembrance on those beaches, the triumphs, the tragedy, and the brilliant plan that ultimately liberated a continent. Tonight, you will hear the stories of some of our heroes, and you will join them as they journey back to Normandy. I'm Martha McCallum. Thank you for joining us for Remembering D-Day, a 75th anniversary special. There was nothing like the German machinery, the capability and leadership of the German military, which was absolutely first rate. They remilitarized the Rhineland, sending troops in there, and, and they were under orders from Hitler that if they encountered any opposition whatsoever, they were to stop. They encountered no opposition. Led by a maniacal and determined Adolf Hitler, Nazi forces laid a systematic plan to seize the rest of Europe. They got away with it, and they then staged the takeovers of Austria and Czechoslovakia in two bites. They then took Poland. Mechanized army of Germany massed for the invasion of Poland. The beginning of the Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. On September 3rd, 1939, just two days after Poland fell, France and Britain declared war on Germany. Hitler has given the word of war, and war it is. Poland has been guaranteed by Great Britain and France, and this aggression compels them to declare war. They then took Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands. Every leader in Europe who was listening to Germany being Nazified, so to speak, with this fundamentally corrupt and barbaric ideology, didn't want to believe that this would spew out of Germany and dominate Europe. They were war weary. The British faced annihilation. British. French, Belgians. Their only hope was to close ranks and back up to the sea. German forces were able to trap the British and, and French armies at, on the coast at Dunkirk. The French began to negotiate at that point. In June of 1940, British troops were surrounded and forced to evacuate France at Dunkirk, leaving the French at the mercy of Nazi forces. They really didn't have the ability to deal with this modern German army. The cancer was too deep. On June 14th, Paris fell. With France occupied, Hitler turned his attention to Britain in July of 1940. In the Battle of Britain, England stood alone, and Coventry was ravaged by Hitler's bombers. The Nazi Air Force, or Luftwaffe, began to bomb the city of London in what was known as the Blitz. Terrified London residents endured relentless bombardment. Most of the attacks at night, they didn't have precision bombing, and so they were basically just carpet bombing the city of London. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill rallied the British people to stay strong. He is the voice of British determination to stick it out, fight Nazi Germany to the bitter end. 
Blitzkrieg strikes with the speed of military lightning. It's an aircraft and it drops a bomb um, and, uh, and it feels like the bomb is aiming for you, um, whether it actually is or not. By the fall of 1940, London was devastated. France had been divided into two parts. In the south, the Free Zone, or Vichy France, where French officials had been exiled. In the north, occupied France, where the Gestapo reigned. It was a military dictatorship. They uh, started rounding up uh, the Jewish population of Paris in waves and holding them. And then ultimately, most of those people were sent to the concentration camps, to Auschwitz and elsewhere, many of, many of them to die. The Allies were dangerously close to the point of no return. They didn't react quickly enough, in my judgment, to what was happening and push back and try to contain Germany and, in a sense, incentivized Hitler. Across the Atlantic, the United States was waiting and watching. We shall send you in ever-increasing numbers, ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. While not directly declaring war, the U.S. government sent supplies and artillery to Britain. Roosevelt called for an unprecedented peacetime draft under the Selective Training and Service Act. The military was very concerned and believed we needed to deal with Germany and, and we would be forced to get into that war. In early August of 1941, President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Churchill drafted the Atlantic Charter. It said that the democratic powers of the world should oppose all uh, expansion by, by force, uh, should not seek accretion of territory on their own, uh, and should in espouse and encourage and try to defend um, freedom for all people. The democracy the West had known for two centuries hung in the balance. The world needed a saving grace. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt went to Congress and, and asked for a declaration of war. He got his declaration of war against Japan. In support of Japan, Germany declared war on the United States on December 11, 1941. The United States was then officially an Allied power. From sub-assembly lines, workmen once skilled in production for peace are now breaking records manufacturing weapons for war. Roosevelt called for production of 50,000 aircraft in a year. Everybody thought he was crazy. They did it twice. The entire economy began right away to shift from a peacetime economy to a wartime economy. Uh, rationing of all strategic materials and food and everything else um, in order to provide for uh, whatever the military needed in order to deal with the war. As the home front ramped up for war, so did the soldiers destined to storm the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. I was supporting a mother and father and I was chosen from a regular infantry division. I was a platoon sergeant of the INR platoon of a regiment, the 417th of the 76th Division. I went in in October of 41. I was supposed to have been drafted in about two or three weeks, but most of the fellas I grew up with were going in the following week, so I was a big shot. I walked down to the draft board and I volunteered. I figured we all stayed together. I volunteered to go with the 101st Airborne, not knowing what was what, but I think it was one of the wisest choices I ever made, and I trained with them at Fort Bragg. Vincent Vicari and Leonard Lamel were unaware of the critical role they would play in one of history's most pivotal battles for world peace. There were a lot of, of men who were underage, um, who, who sought to fight um, because they thought it was the right thing to do. You draw the strength to to fight against something like that from the, the values and will of the people themselves. And that is how you can stand up against something like that because you know it's evil and it has to be stopped. The Japanese must be hurled down to defeat. Their highest stake, their 
future as a naval power. Outgunned, outnumbered, outmatched, our jeep carriers radio for help. Between 1941 and 1943, fighting in the Pacific was raging. By the middle of 43, we've reached the turning point in the, in the Pacific after Midway in, in 42. Things have now turned around and, and the Allies are on the advance in the Pacific. Then the United States did turn its focus to defeating Hitler. Churchill believed the only hope England had to prevail in the war was to get the United States into the war on their side. And so what we see is a series of, of 13 summit conferences, 12 of them involving Roosevelt and Churchill. In May of 1943, the Trident Conference was held in Washington, D.C. Roosevelt, Churchill, and other top American and British military leaders were in attendance. They said, we want to invade Europe as soon as we can. George Marshall believed the only way to defeat the Germans or to defeat them quickly was to force them into a decisive battle. They began to conceptualize a large-scale amphibious assault into France. Operation Overlord, the clandestine plan to invade Normandy and begin to reclaim Europe, was born. Over the next year and a half, Allied leaders developed an intricate plan of legendary proportions. They designate a chief of staff and ultimately they pick Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan to fill that role. He's a British Lieutenant General who does the initial planning for Operation Overlord. The stated objectives were to land with forces of the other Allies, to destroy the German military and cause the Germans to realize they have to surrender. General Eisenhower was in charge of the operation. He was the overall commander in chief and Field Marshal Montgomery was in charge of the invasion force once it got in, into France. But breaking through German defenses into occupied Europe would be a monumental task. Tanks in massive quantities roll eternally from the Nazi production lines. Facing them were four German groups, which consisted of 58 divisions, 10 of which were panzer divisions. Despite an obvious Nazi advantage, the concept of an Allied invasion still haunted Hitler. Hitler issued Fear Directive Order Number 51 in November of 1943, saying that the greatest risk to the Germans was the British and American landing that he anticipated in the West. That was when he appointed Rommel to command that, and he began uh, shifting troops from the East to the West at that time. The Germans were building obstacles for three years prior to the invasion, and they were formidable. And they put the obstacles in the water, that would deny ships the ability to land. There were mines in the water as well. The beaches themselves were just littered with obstacles to prevent soldiers from being able to access the beach and close in on it. An almost solid wall of steel and iron and guns. This feat of engineering was Hitler's Atlantic Wall. It stretched across northern France and continued up the coast through Norway. The Germans, who clearly outnumbered us, had a million men spread out along that coastline, but that coastline was 2,000 miles long. And what, what the Allies wanted is to have the, keep those Germans dispersed along those coastlines so they would not be able to focus their effort in one place. If they were able to do that, the Allied planners knew that the invasion would fail. The key to ensuring the invasion force would face a vulnerable German army was choosing a strategic landing point. They picked Normandy because uh, the Germans expected the landing to come, the, the invasion to come at Calais. The French region of Pas de Calais was closer to England and therefore a more probable invasion point than the beaches of Normandy. The beaches there were uh, were relatively accessible. They were less heavily defended than the beaches were at, at Calais. They were all within reach of fighters based in England. The five beaches were a Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. And they were spread out among 60 miles of coastline. 
a shrewd point of infiltration was only part of this comprehensive mission. The masterminds of the invasion were also tasked with organizing an extraordinary number of troops on the ground to storm those five beaches. We're going to try to liberate a continent. We have to put millions of men through this beachhead. 11,000 airplanes, 50,000 vehicles, and 6,000 ships to include landing craft. Never before in the history of military operations has there been anything like that, and never has there been anything since. The plan is to have uh, uh, 10 divisions launch the attack. There are three British Empire beaches. Gold is a British beach, Juno is the Canadian beach, Sword is the other British beach. There are two American beaches, Omaha and Utah. During 1943 and 1944, the Nazis had most of their efforts focused on the Soviet Union in the east, increasing the Allies' chances of victory at Normandy. Meanwhile, Allied leaders choreographed the invasion, keeping the details classified, even from those who would fight on the front lines. We knew that we were going to have an invasion, how, where, what, why, you know, uh, we had no conception. In addition to keeping it all a secret, extraordinary steps were taken to mislead Hitler's army in an effort to keep them dispersed. The deception plan for Operation Overlord uh, is about imagination and, and brilliance. The Allies knew they were outnumbered and literally outgunned, yet they were the invasion force. It was Operation Fortitude North and Fortitude South. Fortitude North sought to convince the German army that an invasion would be coming through Norway, and Fortitude South turned their attention to Pas de Calais, the more probable invasion point along the French coast. They were really just two pieces of a larger deception plan called Operation Bodyguard, which was designed to make sure the Germans didn't know where or when the Allies would land. Allied leaders assembled both British and American ghost armies. They designed an American army group, headed up by a very famous general, George Patton, who actually was in charge of this paper organization. They used extensive radio deception. They broadcast traffic as though there was a real army there. They were representing something called the first US Army Group, totally fictitious. They had spies who were double agents convincing the Germans that these organizations existed. Rooms full of people who just had uh, radios, uh, and each one represented a major military formation. So you'd have one guy representing a division, the next one representing a corps, the next one representing an army, and they would send out signals saying, you know, we need more Wheaties, um, we need more bullets, we're gonna move from here to there, and they broadcast this traffic um, as though there was a real army there. The Allies covered all bases, not only telecommunications. They used physical uh, deception, they built inflatable tanks, and they put them in the area of eastern England. The Germans believed the landing would come from if they were going to land in Calais. They actually put in place on the ground, literally, hundreds of airplanes made out of plywood. They put up tents. They kept fires burning so that it looked like they were, they were actively occupied. Reconnaissance aircraft came across into Scotland where the British Army Group was, in theory, in place. That's what they saw. So. The Germans were convinced it was going to be an attack in the northern part of Europe, in Norway and Sweden, and those divisions did not move. And they were also convinced that George Patton was going to lead an invasion offset from Normandy, and that is why those forces never moved either. So that deception was very successful. As Hitler prepared for what he perceived to be an impending attack through Pas de Calais and Northern Europe, American, British, and Canadian troops continued to rehearse for the real battle that would take place at Normandy. All along the coasts of Great Britain, the training went on. Navy and Coast Guard landing barges practiced landing operations day and night. We were suddenly training on cliffs on the west coast of England. We started to think, hey, uh, more cliffs, uh, we must have some cliff climbing in our future. Allied troops endured rigorous drills day in and day out in the months and weeks leading up to D-Day, still unaware of where their training might take them. We went to England, we naturally continued our training, not only gliders, but a lot of times they used to take us and put us aboard these LSTs and let us come in over the beach. 
Their training would soon prove invaluable, as the blueprint for D-Day utilized diverse forms of military might with methodical coordination. The Pathfinders, an elite group of paratroopers, would be the first of the invasion force to deploy, set to land behind the beaches. Their mission is to set up navigation zones for the armada of aircraft that are coming. Aircraft that followed would bring more paratroopers, prepared to land behind enemy lines and fortify the western edge of the invasion zone. Bombers were then set to swoop in and pummel German artillery hubs along the coast and continue the assault throughout the morning. Gliders would then follow the bombers, landing behind the bluffs to fulfill the same objectives as the paratroopers, while also bringing with them weapons and medical supplies and navigation tools. Finally, the operation would culminate in an onslaught of amphibious vehicles and Higgins boats on board tens of thousands of Allied troops, equipped to forge past the bluffs and rescue France. The tanks were to go in first, then the first wave, then a second wave to come in about 20 minutes later, more landing craft. Each one of those landing craft was completely scripted. They held 30 men and, and each one had, uh, had so many riflemen, so many bazooka men, so many mortarmen, so many flamethrowers, um, so many engineers that could, could deal with, with barbed wire and that sort of thing. All those formations would be practiced in terms of dealing with heavy machine gun fire and artillery and mortar fire that is impacting on you and getting on the landing craft and getting off the landing craft because paratroopers are practicing jumping out of airplanes and, and making sure that they can assemble properly and be able to accomplish all of their objectives. There are a million and a half Americans in England. They had training camps that were designed to be really accurate representations of places they would have to fight. They seized an area, for example, around a town in, in England called Slapton Sands, in which the, the, the beaches were configured very much like the ones in Utah Beach. Um, same kind of sand, uh, heavy dune, and then flooded area just back of that. Um, they did practice landings there, and, and they, were, they were largely very effective. As a member of the 101st Airborne Division, Vincent Vicari's training focused on parachuting. I was aide to General McAuliffe. He's a Vicari, he says, we're jumping this afternoon. And what do you say to the general? Yes, sir. I didn't know what I was going to do. And we went down to the airfield. Colonel Weisberg, who commanded the 377 Parachute Artillery Battalion, he explained to us, when you were in a plane, you'd get the order, stand up, hook up, check equipment. Then the jump master would come down and check the chutes to make sure they were all in good shape. He said, the red light goes on, you shuffle up to the door. And as soon as the green light goes on, he go out of the plane and we jumped. Yeah, I got a call from the general, the second in command of the 76th Division, asking me how would I like to be a first sergeant of a ranger company. Leonard Lamell trained to storm the beach by sea as part of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. And we'd already been trained in the States as far as amphibious training was concerned with what was called the frogmen. They're known as SEALs today. We were always told that uh, we were supposed to be the best of the best and uh, we'd have the toughest missions and, and we had to be precise and uh, it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to be successful. That was about a year for many of the soldiers. Obviously, some arrived later than that and, and were just sort of thrown into it because they'd all been through some kind of basic training. But nonetheless, we were fortunate to have that time to prepare. The day drew closer, and the true prospect of the mission was revealed. They weren't too complete in their detail of precisely what province or what coast or what this. All in, uh, to keep it secret, you see. But little by little, they were feeding us information. And then, oh, Normandy then, and, and the invasion. Well, they simply told us, uh, you open your mouth, you're out of here. The mission was that when we landed, we had to take the ground, and we had to try and establish a foothold onto France proper. They wanted to do it when they had a full moon. The initial date was to be on the 5th of June. It was finally time for the troops to embark on their journey to the coast of France. We ended up going down to one of the airfields a few days ahead of time, and everyone was checking their equipment. 
We knew what was coming and we were told where, what area we were going to jump into, what our mission would be, what the, was on the ground there. The lead uh, meteorologist told them when the weather was relatively clear on the 4th that it was going to be awful on the 5th and Ike decided that he had to postpone it. Terrible, stormy, rainy, windy. There was a break in the horrible weather, uh, why General Eisenhower changed it from the 5th to the 6th, but that was his only opportunity. They had to have at least about 30 hours lead time for the ships to leave from all over the United Kingdom. We loaded onto the transports that were going to take us over. We left nightfall. We knew there would be thousands of ships because of the hundreds of thousands of guys that were all boarding aboard their transports or whatever they were traveling in. And of course, as uh, we sailed, we could see the ships out there as far as the eye could see. Fooled by Operation Bodyguard and the impending weather, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel left his post. He was in Germany visiting his wife on her birthday because he was going to see Hitler. As the young Allied troops awaited orders, their leaders knew they were sending many of these young men to certain death. General Eisenhower prepared the troops for battle. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Just walked into the plane and that was it. No one, no pilot and co-pilot. Never saw them before. Never saw them after that. As the sun went down on the 5th of June, the thunderous roar of engines and the buffeting of the wind filled the soldiers' ears as they made their initial descent toward Normandy. We were in transport ships. We went across in the darkness of the night of the 5th to the 6th. The night started to crawl in over us and block everything out. But we didn't have much moonlight then. Shortly after midnight and without moonlight, gliders of the British 6th Airborne Division began landing east of Sword Beach pilots relying heavily on their instruments. I became aware of aircraft early in the morning of D-Day. I heard the motors and you know there was 13,000 uh, American aircraft, the British too, uh, coming over in waves. One of the Allies' initial objectives was to seize two bridges of the Orne and Dive River in order to keep German tanks from mounting a counterattack along the coastline. While many soldiers landed in expected territory, others missed their landing zone. British horse gliders, were, which were monstrosities, they, they took a terrific beating. However, 20 minutes past midnight, after a number of casualties, three gliders landed in sight of their objective, and the Con Canal swing bridge, codenamed Pegasus, was captured by the British. Navigating only with a handheld compass and a stopwatch, the first glider landed having cruised for 10 minutes. They succeeded in capturing it within three minutes. As the British sent out the coded success signal, ham and jam, to their allies, Operation Overlord was underway, and the order of invasion planned by the masterminds launched. Initially, um, specially trained paratroopers went in. They were called pathfinders, and they carried lights and radio beacons, set up the beacons, and that would then be used by the, by the pilots following them with the main force of paratroopers um, that would come in. They were then followed by the main body of paratroopers from the 82nd to 101st Airborne, um, and they, uh, they too were widely scattered, which made it hard for them to do their job. These American paratroopers had obscured landing zones due to low-hanging clouds that blocked moonlight. Paratroopers fell in the sea, drowned in flooded areas, were blown up in the air by the Germans. Some dropped so low that their parachutes didn't even have a chance to open. See these tracer bullets coming up and as you get close to the ground you could hear the ground fire but it was so widely spread we had no idea of actually in what location in general locations yes but specifically no because we jumped into the towns you went into the woods some of the guys went into the rivers some a lot of them went into the hedgerows 
and got tangled up in the hedgerows that were there in Normandy. All I know is I landed, laid there a second, then ran my hand down my leg to make sure no bone was sticking out. Took my shoot off and just ran around just trying to make contact with people. Wherever they landed, they had to figure out where they were located and, they, and the, their commanders told them, go to the nearest objective to that location and that was a brilliant tactic. American paratroopers dropped in adjacent to the main road in Cherbourg, near the strategically significant town of Saint Marie Glaze, and ground fighting with the German troops ignited. Then, as planned, at approximately 2 a.m., an Allied assault from the skies ensued, with bombers targeting German points of defense along the beach in an effort to minimize the supply of weaponry aimed at the invading Allies. Now this aerial bombardment also is very focused because there's no secret now to where we're going. The bombers flew in perpendicular to the coast instead of flying along the coast. If they fly along the coast, they're subject to anti-aircraft fire all the time, where if they fly perpendicular, they're only shot at while they're actually over the coast. Carrying supplies and artillery to support the paratroopers, more gliders then swooped in, also struggling to make their landing points. General Pratt who was the assistant division commander. His glider landed and, and he got killed. The gliders were just scattered all over the place. Meanwhile, after a few hours of fighting at Saint Maria Glaze, the town became the first in France to be liberated. It was then time for the largest part of the invasion, the amphibious assault. Uh, came over the intercom or loudspeaker said, and your boats were going ashore, and the invasion's going to be started. At 6.30 a.m., also known as H Hour, the first of the seaborne troops landed on Omaha Beach, giving troops of the initial bombardment hope to turn the wreckage around. The landing at Utah Beach was a mile and a half east of where it was supposed to, because the tide coming in created a current that moved the landing craft eastward, and it was not as heavily defended as the intended beachhead was. We had a three-prong mission here, and the most important thing is find those guns and destroy them so they can't kill thousands of men. That was number one. Number two, get out to the coast road and establish a roadblock so that the Germans can't get from Utah Beach to Omaha Beach. And the third part of the mission was to destroy all German communications so the Germans could not talk to each other or communicate. Companies or groups of landing craft were deployed consecutively, each with a separate mission. Leonard Lamel came ashore as the commander of Company D in conquest of Pointe Hoc, an important German artillery hub high on the cliffs. When the ramp goes down, we push the buttons, throw these rockets up over the cliff. That cliff's 100 feet high, and the guys pull the ropes to get the traction so they can climb the rope. I was the first one shot through the right side, and I didn't know who shot me. The landing at Utah Beach went very smoothly. They had just about 200 fatalities on D-Day, um, far fewer than they expected. On Omaha Beach, the death toll was much higher. Army intelligence underestimated the number of highly effective German soldiers in the area, and preliminary air and naval bombardment were unsuccessful in knocking out strong defense targets. As soon as the Germans saw the boats and realized they were landing. They opened fire when the boats got close to shore um, with artillery, and then uh, as soon as uh, the boats reached, they would open fire with their machine guns. Germans had two machine guns, the MG-34 and the MG-42. The MG-42 was probably the best machine gun made in the, in the war. On Omaha, it was a matter of getting out of the water was a problem. Getting on the beach was a problem. Getting inland was a problem and all of this took hours to do. Many of the boats sank and troops drowned before ever making it to the shore under the weight of the equipment they carried. Some guys had a heavier load, like a radio man would have uh, about 50 pounds on his back. The counterattacking forces in France, right away they start to mobilize those forces. They're standing up there shooting. They were dropping mortars. They were doing everything to keep us from landing. 
As the death toll continued to climb on the beaches, it seemed as though the Allies were no match for the Nazi defenses. By 7.30 a.m., Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who was at home in Germany celebrating his wife's birthday, started to make his journey back to headquarters at La Roche-Guillon, after his chief of staff informed him that the invasion was underway. The German news agency Transocean said today in a broadcast that the Allied invasion had begun. Invasion operations began with the landing of airborne troops in the area of the mouth of the Seine River. Meanwhile, in Normandy, the assaults continued. Although defensive obstacles such as underwater mines took their toll, Allied soldiers on the other beaches fared better compared to troops on Omaha, who were leaderless and terrified. Survivors who made it past the bluffs huddled at the top together, witnessing dead and dying comrades as they attempted to push further inland. You can imagine the intimidation that's taking place there with the soldiers. When you step out off that landing craft, and you're watching people be mowed down around you, and actually what is, what is graphically happening to their bodies right in front of your eyes. You're seeing something that you've never ever seen before in your life. And you're seeing it not just occasionally, you're seeing it all around you where the water is actually running with blood. And yet, you're still trying to move forward. And that's where the courage comes in, that's where the training comes in, that's where the tenacity comes in. Despite his wounds, Leonard Lamel and the second Rangers made it to Pointe de Hoc, but the German guns were nowhere to be found. The Germans stuck telephone poles to make it look from the sky, the aerial photographs, that they were still there. They had to go on a hunt for them, but the cost in the lives of his Rangers had already been so high. I landed with 22 guys who I started up in the cliffs and I lost half of them. Finally, around 11.30 a.m., conditions started to improve. Ships closed in on the beaches and blasted the German positions at point-blank range. Troops reached the cliffs and allies along the coast poured inland. We quickly stuffed a lot of grenades in our jackets that the guys gave us and ran back and used the rest of them on the remaining guns. And it didn't make any noise. It didn't draw any attention uh, from the Germans. We got it done. The sheer thrust and force of what was taking place overwhelmed that counterattacking force. One of the problems that they suffered from, and it goes back to the deception plan itself, is that we held them dispersed over 2,000 miles of coastline. By early afternoon on D-Day, the forces that had come across Utah Beach and the airborne began to link up inland. German strongpoints were seized, including strategic fortification WN-72, opening the route to the main road. The natives there, they were very, very helpful. They would tell you where German installations or where German soldiers were at on the Carentan Peninsula. The people were tremendous, even though a lot of them may have been in jeopardy. I spoke to uh, a lot of soldiers who were participated in it. Um, the French people were helping them in identifying where German soldiers were when they would go into a small community. By able to move in and get some depth in terms of terrain ownership, now you've got a lodgement. And once you're able to do that, then you're able to bring in tanks, and now you're building up major, major capacity. By late afternoon, with Rommel back at headquarters, Hitler finally issued an order. It stated the entire Normandy beachhead must be cleaned up by no later than that night. It was already too late by the time Rommel returned. They were firmly established ashore, and, and he believed that the war was over. Um, he advised that Hitler should negotiate a deal with the Allies because they weren't going to win in the West. At the end of the day, the Allies forged behind enemy lines, and Field Marshal Montgomery took control of the troops on the ground as the invasion phase of European liberation ended. The groups start to get together. We felt we had accomplished what we were set there to do. Just two months later, on August 25th, the Allies took back Paris. 
establishing a foothold in France from which the liberation of the rest of Western Europe would originate. After the liberation of Paris, the operation moved into Belgium and north of France. What the Americans did in, in, in landing in Normandy was preserve Western Europe for democracy, but had this not happened, it's altogether possible the Germans would have dominated Europe into the 21st century. I think throughout the whole invasion of Europe, the ingenuity of the American soldier was what won the war. In total, casualties on D-Day reached approximately 10,000. They were all fathers, sons, brothers, husbands. They all had families. As the word began to get back uh, that they were, uh, that the casualty rate was as high as it was, um, there, were, there were mixed feelings. There was joy that, that the landing had been made and the landing had succeeded. Um, there was uh, enormous grief over the losses. As I was asked one time, did you ever think of getting killed or being a hero? And my answer was no one ever wanted to get killed. I think what we need to take away from that is the lesson that freedom isn't free, it has a very high cost, and that people in a democracy have to be willing to pay that price if we want to preserve the liberty that we enjoy today. Veterans who stormed those beaches on June 6th, back in 1944, ventured back to those hallowed grounds as part of the excursion group called the Greatest Generations Foundation Normandy Experience. They never forgot the triumphs or the horrors of that day. I came back was 10 years after the invasion. It was very hard for me the first time. You know, too many memories. I broke down and I cried for 70 years. I never talked about it. The French people, especially in this part of the country, they absolutely love us because we liberated them. This is called a Higgins boat. Churchill said that the Higgins boat helped win the war. So I used this for the invasion of Normandy and then the invasion of southern France. Frank DeVita made numerous trips to and from Omaha Beach in this type of Higgins boat, bringing groups of invasion troops to the shore. So when I dropped the ramp, I had 32 men on the boat. Three men got off, and they were killed immediately right here. The rest of the kids were on the boat. 27 of them either wounded or dead, and they were crying, Mama, Mama, Mama. So sad, so sad. And you see on the stern of the boat, there's two machine guns. They took the machine guns away from us because they were afraid of friendly fire and there was no friendly fire. The only fire was from the Germans. What the Germans fired that day claimed the lives of thousands, members of an eternal brotherhood to which Frank DeVita and fellow veteran Stephen Melnikoff still belong. They visited some of their lost brothers at the Bayou War Cemetery. The way I look at it, somebody took a hit for me, and that's why I'm here. And so I come back, I'm deep respect for these guys. 400,000 people that, uh, that lost their lives, buried all over the world in all the world's seas and oceans. You know, most of these kids died at 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. When we hit the beach, there were three infantry divisions, of Br two British. They were right there with us, and uh, they took the fight just as badly as we did. I think um, my generation was better prepared because we were I'll just say it, we were tougher. Both veterans vowed to ensure that the memory of D-Day and those who died there will never be forgotten. It's not easy. Uh, many people were killed, traumatized, and the millions of people suffered. I was very fortunate, have good health, able to give a message, and that's what I plan to do for the rest of that time. And I like to make sure that they realize that uh, freedom's not cheap. But I had two people watching over me, Jesus and my mom. These people died all around me, but God was good to me. 
My generation was a generation that went to Europe and the Pacific, and we saved the world from the tyranny of the Japanese and the, and the Germans. That was my purpose. These are my heroes. You know, they, they think we're heroes. We're not heroes. We're survivors. These are the heroes. These are the heroes. Since the pivotal moment the Allies established that first beachhead in Normandy, 75 years have passed. And today we honor our brave. In General Eisenhower's words, to these we owe the high resolve that the cause for which they died shall live on. I'm Martha McCallum. Thank you for watching.